Amen. Thank you, brass guys. That was great. They'll be back. They'll be back. Okay. If you turn in your Bibles, please, today to the book of 2 Chronicles, chapter 7 and verse 14. I'm going to be reading a familiar passage, particularly on days like today when we are celebrating our nation's independence and our country's founding. <clears throat> And we're looking at the subject today of how to heal, how to heal, not hurt, America. Many of you, if you're like me, uh, one, of, one of my favorite movies is uh, It's a Wonderful Life with Jimmy Stewart uh, playing the uh, lead role in a, in a film about him thinking his life is empty and worthless and he's made no contributions and, and coming to the point of taking his life. And, and just before he attempts to take his life, this uh, fictitious angel, odd body, appears, and it's really an odd angel, and he takes the Jimmy back through his life if he had not ever lived, because he, he's thinking, I, I, would, I should have never lived. And, and, and they show what his town would have been like, Bedford Falls, Pennsylvania, what it would have been like if he'd never lived. And in showing what Bedford Falls would have been like, I mean, uh, without his influence, it shows a nation or a town uh, that was filled with uh, economic dominance by the wealthy. It was characterized by uh, illicit gambling, sex trafficking, uh, drug abuse of every kind, and all sorts of vices that those who viewed the film, which was produced for release in 1946, 1947, 70 some odd years ago, would view it repulsively by see seeing that those kind of behaviors would have been normative had George Bailey never lived. But what we see in that film as repulsive in 1946 has become the norm in 2019. And we wonder how did that happen so quickly where the, the primary values that were embraced World War II generation, most of them have been rejected. And now the vices that were rejected then are elevated today. And certainly we need healing in our land. We desperately need revival in our land. And that film shows just how stark the contrast is between how life used to be and how life is today. Now, in 2 Chronicles 7, 14, the, the, the verse is written to the people of Israel. It's written to uh, Jews who had a theocracy with God being their leader, with a God-appointed king, David, and then Solomon, and God is giving instructions to Solomon. He says to Solomon, now, Solomon, if, if Israel falls into rebellion, uh, my people, my sacred call people, the apple of my eye, if they fall into rebellion, this is what you are to do. Now, while this promise may not specifically apply to us because we're not Israel, it does generally apply to how you and I are to live as good citizens regardless of our nationality, and no nation could help but be blessed if Christians behave thusly. And so we read, beginning in verse 14 of chapter 7 in Second Chronicles, If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins, and will heal their land. Father, we pray today as we do celebrate the birth of our nation, uh, we pray knowing we are incredibly blessed and, and phenomenally blessed, perhaps unprecedentedly blessed. And yet when we see uh, sins now that used to be shunned, embraced, and boasted of, uh, and publicized, and, and others encouraged to adapt them. 
we as Christians wonder what has happened to our country, what has happened to our land. And we pray that you would give us some insight and wisdom today as we analyze this scripture text regarding what your expectations are of us, how we are to behave and how we are to relate to a world that's so lost about us and a nation that seems to have lost its way. Guide us now, we pray, in Jesus' name, amen. What are our responsibilities? How are we to live in what has become post-Christian America? Well, first we look at what's our part. What is God saying we are to do? Who does God expect us to be? Well, he says, first of all, if my people... That is, there's a relationship there. It's possessive. I own you. We have a relationship with each other if my people. So the assumption is uh, he's writing to folks that know the Lord. And so this morning as we gather, be sure that uh, you know the Lord. This scripture won't apply to you. Uh, Do you know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? Have you come to a point in your life where you repented of sin, asked Christ to save you, and are willing to make him Lord of your life. That's, that's, that's the starting place. Those are the starting blocks in the Christian life. So uh, knowing God is preeminent. Do you know God? Do you know Christ? Philippians 3.10, the Apostle Paul, writing to the church at Philippi, said, Oh, that I may know him, and the fellowship of sharing of his suffering, uh, but that I could know him, was a driving ambition of his life to, to know the Lord and to grow in his knowing the Lord, to grow in understanding of the Lord. Now, suppose for a moment... Uh, you were asked to view some major sports activities. You were shown a video clip of basketball. You were shown a video clip of soccer, a video clip of lacrosse, a video clip of baseball, and a video clip of football. And you were asked to name each one of those sports just by observing a, a brief video clip. And the clip of football just happened to be the Georgia Bulldogs. And so you watch it all, and you come to the clip of football, and you see Georgia Bulldogs playing, you say, well, that's football. And because you identified football, you say, well, I must be an expert, because out of all those sports I viewed, I immediately knew what football was. So I know football. Well, of course, anybody that follows football knows that you've got to do more than just recognize the sport. I mean, there's some some intricacies to the sport that you want to become familiar with. You know, there's an offense. You know, there's a defense. You know, there's 11 players on each side. You know what the positions are on each side. But you can't just casually say, well, I know football, because I could pick it out from baseball and soccer. Then you got to say, well, if you're playing an opposing team, what's their strengths on defense? So let me engineer my offense accordingly. What's their strengths on offense so I can engineer my defense accordingly? You've got to know a lot of intricacies to really know football. Well, some of us, when it comes to knowing Christ, we say, well, I know Christ. I know church. I mean, uh, I attend Flat Creek Baptist Church, so I know church. And and they preach about God, so I know God. Well, you may have a, a, a surface understanding of God, But as far as an in-depth relationship that the Bible's calling for here in verse 14, that's a foreign concept to you. You know, you're not growing in the Lord. You're not spending time daily in God's Word. Not spending time daily in prayer. Not really hungering and thirsting for righteousness sake, as the Scripture tells us that we should. That's how you know God. That's how you're God's people. And just like you wouldn't say you're an expert just by identifying football from other sports, So you're not an expert in your relationship with God just because you know there's one up there but have no idea what a relationship with him really looks like. So know God, number one, that's our part. Number two, be humble. If my people who are called by my name and they identify with me will humble or debase themselves. We're called to be humble. 1 Peter 5, 6. Humble yourself below beneath the mighty hand of God and he will exalt you in due time. And so humility is key to being positioned for God's blessing in life, not thinking too highly of yourself or myself or even of our nation, but to realize that but for God's grace, I am nothing. In fact, I've been doing a little research. Did you know that we come from dust 
and we return to dust. From dust we come, from dust we shall return. And we're told that the dust that comprises us, the monetary value of your dust, that's your stuff, your dust, is between 4 and $5. That's about all you're worth. When you return to dust, that, that's, that's how much value you're going to leave, about 4 or $5 worth of dust. Now looking out, some of you may reach $7, but uh, <clears throat> you're going to leave a little more dust than others. But, but we just ain't worth a whole lot. We're just dust. And so don't, don't take too, think too highly of yourself. Realize, but, but from God's grace, I wouldn't have air to breathe. I wouldn't have the heart beating in my chest. I wouldn't have the gravity holding me to the surface of this planet. I wouldn't be riding this rock around the sun unless God kept it in a bright, right orbit. I mean, everything is a gift from God. So humble yourself and realize you ain't near as good as you think you are. You're not near as special as you think you are. You're worth four or five bucks, and that's about it. <laughs> so humble yourself before the Lord. He also says what I expect of you, not just that you know me and be humble, but also when you pray, pray sincerely. If my people are called by my name and humble themselves and pray. And when we say and pray, we're not just singing, now I lay me down to sleep, or thank you for the food I'm about to eat. Prayer is connection with a holy God. It's an intimate level that is foreign to just a surface relationship. Uh, most of the time, our prayer is driven by the current crisis we're in. God help me! I'm in a mess. I need you now! And his response probably is, well, why, didn't, why weren't you calling on me yesterday? Why'd you wait till today? Why'd you wait till you were in trouble? You pray out of conviction, not crisis. Prayer should always be your first choice, not your last chance. But most of the time, we don't truly, genuinely pray and get a hold of God and pray through to Him unless we're in a mess, we're failing a test, we lost a job, somebody walked out, then I'll pray. But you know, it's kind of like it was when I used to take a lot of trips and uh, overseas mission trips and, and uh, God bless in a lot of ways and a lot of good friends and some are here this morning and as a result of all that, but uh, I try to, when I take these trips, mostly to Eastern Europe, sometimes to Asia, I try to bring something back to Debbie and the children and, and uh, just some little trinket of some sort, a memento of the trip that I took and where I was, Russia, Ukraine, Romania, wherever, and bring them just a little something back. And I remember the first time or two that I returned from trips uh, they were so glad to see me. Oh, Daddy, Daddy, we missed you so much. We're so glad to see you. Couldn't wait for you to get home. Well, thank you for coming home. And it was just so wonderful. But, you know, by trip three, maybe trip four, it was, Daddy, we're glad you're home. What'd you bring us? <laughs> what you got for me? And, and you, you kind of feel like, well, did, did you really miss me or just want me to bring you something? How do you think God feels? When the only time he hears from you is when you want something. What can you do for me today? Instead of a deep, growing, personal relationship and walk with the Lord. That's what he's desiring from us. Why should we desire less from him? And so he says, you want to see healing in your land, in your personal life? Know me first. Have that personal walk. Be humble. Pray sincerely. And then seek me. Humble themselves and pray and seek my face. Seek the Lord. Jeremiah 29, 13. Seek the Lord and he shall be found. Search for him with all your heart and you will find him. You will know him. And by seeking God, you discover God. And you discover a whole new dimension of life that you didn't even know existed. Because most of us operate on the surface level. We're, we're generic Christians, sometimes at best. And not only do we not have that close abiding relationship, but when we even talk about it, it's, well, he's the man upstairs. Or, you know, I, yeah, I, I prayed when my mama was sick. I mean, that, that's kind of it. That's kind of the extent of it. But if we're really seeking God and pursuing righteousness, Matthew 6, 33, 
Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, then all other things, everything else you need in life will be added to you. When we're seeking him first, primary, utmost, it's amazing how that relationship prospers and grows. Kind of like the story I read years ago about uh, two boys along the Mississippi River were fishing and, and uh, they caught a lot of fish and wondered how, how they're going to get them all home because they journeyed a long way to fish and pretty soon a riverboat comes by. And one of the boys said, well, I'll just call that riverboat over and, and uh, we'll jump on it and then he'll carry us down the river home. And his friend said, you're crazy. That, that riverboat captain, he's not, he's not going to pay attention to you. He's, he's, got, uh, he's got commerce on that boat. He's got pastures on that boat. He's got an arrival time. You're crazy. Well, the other boy didn't pay attention. He starts jumping on the bank and hollering and waving his arms. And you know what? Pretty soon, <laughs> that riverboat turns and makes its way to the bank and, and lowers this plank and, and the boys run on. And, and, and the guy that was a skeptic is just aghast. How, how, in, how did you make this happen? And the other boy said, oh, I forgot to tell you, my daddy's the captain. <laughs> when you live on a supernatural level, your daddy's the captain. And others learn that. And they're drawn to a closer walk with him because of what they see in you. What they hear from you, what they observe from you. How we live our life is a profound witness. So God says, I want you to seek after me. But he also says, I want you to turn from sin. Seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. As I earlier stated the, the stark contrast from the 1946 movie, It's a Wonderful Life, where we are repulsed by sin, has now become the norm. And God says to Christians, not just to lost people, they're lost. They don't, they've got an excuse. They don't know any better. The problem is when Christians behave that way, when Christians participate in those kind of behaviors, when, when those are characterized as general normative Christian behavior, that, that's the bigger issue. And God says to Christians, you turn from your wicked ways. First, you've got to admit you got them. And you can't be excusing it by comparing yourself to other people. Well, they do it, so I'll be able to do it. No, no, that, God's the standard. Jesus is the standard. Always look to Jesus. Uh, men, people will always disappoint. God never does. So he's always the standard. So you look to him, Romans 8, 29, be conformed to his image, be like Jesus, through the power of his indwelling Holy Spirit. But as you look to him, you see how you're supposed to live, how you and I, the choices we're to make, and the example we're supposed to set. You know, Jonah was called to preach to Nineveh in the book of Jonah. And he, he, he boldly proclaimed the word of God only after he had run from God. He said, I don't, I don't want to preach to those Ninevites, they're... They're mean, barbarous people. They're ruthless in how they treat their enemies. And I don't want them to repent. I just assume they go to hell. It's kind of Jonah's attitude. But after a big fish swallowed him, and he probably was bleached by, by his intestines, and he got vomited out, he learned his lesson real quick. And uh, he went and preached to Nineveh. And maybe the Ninevites, they saw the bleached skin perhaps of Jonah, and they thought, my goodness, if we don't turn this, what's going to happen to us? What happened to him? And so they repented. And in sackcloth and ashes, didn't eat, fasted, didn't even drink. And God spared Nineveh. God was going to destroy Nineveh, but he, because they responded to his proclamation of his prophet, uh, he spared the nation. And they knew they had to turn. They knew they had to repent. America's got to do that, but you and I have got to do that too. God wants a righteous people. God wants a holy people. And he's calling us all to that standard. Unfortunately, we're, we're like uh, how people up north, the Inuits, used to hunt wolves. They'd, they'd put some bait around a double-bladed knife, stick it in the ice with the bait on top. The wolf would smell the scent, be drawn to the knife, and they'd start eating the bait. And soon they'd come to that knife blade, and they'd start... Their tongue would start bleeding, but because they were just so driven by the, what they were eating, they thought they were eating the victim's blood, not their own. 
And eventually they would bleed to death. And that's how, they, how the Inuits would kill the wolf. Well, America is licking on a knife that's draining its lifeblood. And there's eternal consequences. There's a payday someday. There's a judgment day someday. And all of us got to be aware of that and get our spiritual act together, spiritual life together, if we want God to one day again bless this nation and forestall judgment that could come. That's our part. But what's God's part? What does he do? How does he respond to our appropriate behavior? Humble themselves, pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways. Then, God says, then, it's conditional, then I'll hear from heaven. I will hear. Don't you want to know that God hears your prayer? Wouldn't you like to know you're getting true that is getting beyond the ceiling? Isaiah 59, 1 and 2, God's hand is not so short he cannot save, nor is his ear so dull he can't hear, but your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, so he does not hear you. Your iniquities have made a separation, so as a result, he does not hear you. You know, we pray, we pray for families, we pray for a job, we pray for prosperity, we pray for health. And God says, if you've got unconfessed sin you're refusing to turn from, I'm not hearing that one. That was not making it past the ceiling. Now think about that. If you're willfully remaining in sin, refusing to repent, God's saying your refusal to repent is causing a barrier between me and you. It only comes through confession. So God says, I'll, I'll hear when you repent. I'll hear when you forsake. You read the book of Esther. Queen Esther is asked to go before the king and make a request for the Jews and Mordecai, her uncle, and she says, I can't go because we're not allowed unless we're invited to go in the king's presence. And Mordecai says, well, you've got to go. Your nation's life and existence depends on this, even if, it takes, even if your own life is taken. And so the custom was, if you weren't invited, you could be beheaded, you could be executed, unless the king extends his golden scepter. And then you could come and make your request. Well, the king sees Esther, and she's frightened to death. What could happen to her? But he extends his scepter and she makes a request and the Jews are spared. Well, God says to you and me, if you confess your sin and forsake your sin, I extend the scepter. The door's open. We've got open communication. Come and hear. God says, I will hear your prayer. And then he says, I will, the second thing I'll do, I'll forgive your sin. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sin... He is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all, not most or part, from all unrighteousness. And so the way you eliminate the sin barrier is through confession, agreeing with God it's wrong, telling God, I don't want to keep doing this. Please forgive me, give him the power to overcome this. And the veil is lifted, the ceiling's removed, and you have open communication with God. I'll hear, I'll hear your prayer, I'll forgive your sin. Back in the 14th century, Robert the Bruce was a, a powerful political figure in Scotland. And uh, one day he was being pursued by an English king, and the English king was overwhelming Scottish villages so much so that he got Robert the Bruce's home and got his own hounds and gave his hounds their master's scent and had Robert the Bruce's own hounds chasing after him. Well, he was running away from the English with one of his uh, bodyguards, and they, they came to a river, and they could hear the hounds baying. And Robert the Bruce said, let's get in the water. It'll take our scent away, and they can't travel. So they got in water, began waving upstream, and the stream took their scent downstream. They were able to escape with their lives, and one day he became king of Scotland. Well, that's what God says he does to our sin and the stain and unforgiveness of sin. He wipes it away. He washes it away. He takes it downstream and remembers it no more. Would you like that to happen for you? It's a free gift from God. I take the curse of sin and I wash it downstream, but not through water, through the blood of my son. 
And when Jesus shed his blood on Calvary's cross, he paid the penalty we couldn't pay for sin we could not atone for and gives us free pardon. I will hear from heaven. I will forgive your sin. And then he says, I will heal their land. Well, this was a promise to Israel, as we said. It was about healing of Israel, and that could come. And perhaps to a degree, healing to America could come as well. But certainly, as far as our responsibility goes, we want healing in our homes. Healing in our relationships. Healing in our lives. Healing in our sphere of influence. Healing in our workplace. Healing in our school. Healing in our neighborhood. What all begins in that personal walk and relationship with the Lord. Jeremiah 8, 22 talks about, is there not a balm, a healing salve in Gilead? Isn't there something that could bring healing to a broken soul? And from that verse, the old spiritual was written that goes something like this. There's a balm in Gilead to make the wounded whole and heal the sin-sick soul. Sometimes I feel discouraged. I think my work's in vain. But then the Holy Spirit revives my soul again. I may not be able to preach like Peter. I may not be able to pray like Paul. But I can tell the love of Jesus that all could be saved. And so you and I likewise know there is a bomb in Gilead to make the wounded whole and to heal the sin-sick soul. And perhaps this morning, that's where you are. A wounded soul a sin-sick soul. And God says there is a balm in Gilead, but the balm is the blood and grace of my son, already given just for you and for a land that's so wayward and so needy. Would you trust me to heal you and in turn heal your land?